What I want to share with you is from the Gospel of Mark. Turn to Mark chapter 3. We continue our series, and if you'll remember, Mark is deliberate and intentional. He is direct. He is fierce. And as he quoted Jesus, he said that the forceful take it by force. And so he is really declaring Peter's uh, story of Christ's Gospel. And we come to this next point where Jesus is going to start drawing dividing lines. I don't know if you've ever had to been in a situation where you had to draw the line on something, but there are times you need to separate yourself from certain things. And Jesus is going to be drawing lines through this next portion of Scripture that I want to take you to. So we begin at Mark chapter 3, verse 7. It says this, Jesus withdrew with His disciples to the sea, And a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Umea and beyond the Jordan and from Tyre and Sidon. That's a lot of places. That's a lot of people. Sounds like a big crowd, wouldn't you say? This isn't just the folks from Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem and all of Judea and Galilee. Those are provinces. Jerusalem's a city. Galilee and Judea are province areas. It'd be like saying people came to Christ Community Church in Roseville and from Oakland County and from Wayne County. And that's what it's talking about. People are coming from all over. And they came from beyond the Jordan and Tyre and Sidon. And when the great crowd heard all that He was doing, they came to Him. And He told His disciples to have a boat ready for Him because the crowd, lest they crush Him. Woo, Peter, get a boat ready, man. These people are coming in on me and they want to crush me. Why? Why are they there? It goes on to say this, so that all had disease, uh, all that had diseases pressed around him to touch him. I got to get a hold of him. I got to touch him. I can be healed if I could touch him. Demons will be leaving me if I could just touch him. I got to get to him. Now you don't have 1,000, 2,000. You have 10,000 of people pressing in for one man. Get me on the boat! But there are many times Jesus would get in a boat and set out from the shore so that He understood the the, the science of sound so that when He would speak, it would echo off the waters unto the multitudes and He could speak to that many people at once. But what I like here is Jesus draws a line between Him and the crowds. Jesus doesn't do what the crowds want. He does what the Father wants. And I have to ask you, as we're drawing lines here, as Jesus is drawing lines, He's going to draw lines in your life as well. Are you a people pleaser? Do you do what the crowd wants? And how many churches are going the way of the crowds? We could get more people if we did this, if we did that, if we didn't do this. And they follow the crowds instead of what Father says to do. Jesus put a delineation between Him and the people. He would minister to them. But there was a time when He had to separate from them because they couldn't dictate what He needed to do. It goes on and it says this, whenever an unclean spirit saw Him, they fell down before Him and cried out, You're the Son of God! And He strictly ordered them not to make Him known. (laughs) Shut up! Every time. Now, how many demon-infested people are there in this crowd? So they're trying to get close. Every time someone gets close, someone needs to touch them to get healed. I'm healed! Someone comes close and the demon goes, You're the Son of God! Shut up! And then someone else comes and goes, I'm healed! And they You're the Son of God! Shut up! <laughs> this thing's going crazy. So, you know, it can get crazy in church when God shows up. How many of you know that? It's kind of funny. We like everything sedate and and keep it in order. And a lot of church keep it in order. Don't do that. But you know what? If Jesus is in the house, it's got to get crazy. Things got to get off. But He's in control. And He's the one who is dictating. And so we see that He's drawing lines. Now look, at He draws another line and it says this. He went up on the mountain and He called to Him those whom He desired. So there are those whom He desired. Now there's the crowds, but then there are those He calls unto Himself. And so He draws another line of delineation. Do you know there were a lot of crowds that followed Jesus? And what did they follow Him for? To get something from Him. They were consumers. They wanted their healing. They wanted their deliverance. They want this. They want that. They want this. 
It wasn't too much about Him. It was about them. And how many have churches have turned into it's all about the Christians? We go to church to see what we can get. We shape church for Christianity and Christians instead of to the glory of God. We're here for Him. And we leave sometimes and say, well, that was nice, but I didn't like that song. And he went on this way. You know what? It ain't about you. So get into gear here and put your focus on Him. He called those whom He desired to come to Him. And He appointed twelve whom He also named apostles so that they might be with Him and He might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Now He called twelve because twelve in Hebrew is the governmental number. It's the number of authority in government. We see twelve tribes. He called twelve disciples. And as Rabbi Jesus is calling these twelve, He's expecting these twelve to become imitators of Him. As imitators of Him, every disciple of their rabbi, no matter who the rabbi was, they studied that rabbi so that they would one day take the place of that rabbi. Know his teachings, which were called his yoke. They would take his yoke upon them. All of you who are weary and heavy laden, what? Come to me and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke, my teachings upon you, and they are light because He is the truth. And if you have the truth, you'll be set free. Nothing lighter than that, right? And so these 12 are the governing authority that are going to live, act, and move as Jesus does. And they're going to disciple others who will disciple others who will disciple others till 2,000 years from now, we've got a room full of disciples who are imitating Jesus. And He called them to Himself. He drew another line to delineate this group from the world. You're not of the world and you're not part of the world. You're now my disciples. You don't follow the ways of the world. You follow the ways of your master, Yeshua, Jesus. And he said, this is why he called them. Number one, that they might be with him. See, the other people weren't willing to give that up. How many of you remember when there was a crowd around Jesus, they came because he fed them. And so the next day they all gathered around. John tells us this in John 6. They came over because they all wanted more food. <laughs> Free meal. This is great. I'll take a Whopper and a cheeseburger, Jesus. So Jesus, seeing the crowd, hey, now if he was from the 20th century, he'd play to the crowd. He'd cook knockwurst and, and all sorts of stuff and flip burgers so that he'd get more people. Not Jesus. Jesus would draw a line to delineate the serious, those who want truth, from those who just want something for themselves. And so Jesus said in the crowd, hey, listen, uh, you folks who want something to eat, look, and i got to tell you something. If you want any more of this, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Okay? And guess what happened to the crowd? <laughs> Jesus said, I'm calling this 12 so that they'll be with me. Why with me? So they'll know how to act the way I act. Everywhere I go when I lay hands and cast out demons, they're going to learn how to do it. I'm going to go to Galilee. I'm going to go to the Jordan. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to go where there's trouble. I'm going to go to the where there's demonics. I'm going to go everywhere and you're going to go with me and the dust of my feet should be on your robes. You're that close to me. How many of you are willing to go where Jesus goes? Ah, yeah, okay. How many of you are willing to leave your job today when he says go? Two years of retirement. Hold on. Couldn't we time this a little better, Jesus? Let's think this through, Lord. You know, we put all these concepts on here, but when Jesus says let's go, he went to the tax collector. He said, follow me. He says, you bet. To the fishermen, follow me. Drop the nets. Because they were following their master. There's going to be a line of demarcation between those who say they believe in Jesus and those who follow Jesus. There is a difference, a marked difference. He said he, the reason he wants them with him is so that he can send them out. You be with Jesus enough, you'll act like him, talk like him, walk like him, trust him, and then you can go out and be him for a dying world. This world needs Jesus. They don't need more Christians. 
And we have to delineate nowadays from Christian because everybody uses the word Christian. Now we have to delineate and say you're a Christ follower because many Christians do not follow Christ. It's become a cultural thing. And there's another line drawn or a delineation with these. He's going to send them out. What's he going to send them out to do? Two things. To preach. To preach what? The kingdom, the gospel, to preach the gospel. And what is that gospel? What is that kingdom? His yoke, his teaching. You can't preach it if you don't know it. You can't preach it if you haven't lived it. And so he wants them to be with him so that they can go out and preach what they hear him teaching. And last of all, to have authority to cast out demons. Consider this, that the mark of Jesus' disciples is that They cast out demons and the enemy flees. You've got to ask yourself, how is it that Satan got so entangled in the children of Israel? These are the chosen people. This is where God dwells, in Jerusalem, in the temple. They're His covenant people. How did the devil get into that garden of Israel? Just like he did the garden of Eden. People weren't paying attention. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus shows up to come forcefully to bring the kingdom, that there's so many demoniacs in God's chosen people? Could happen the same in church. What do you think? Sure sign of those who are followers of Jesus, demons have to flee. Demons go. We've got a church in America where we don't even believe in demons anymore. Most churches think that was old. That's that's back then. There are no demons now. Have they not picked up a newspaper? Do they not watch TV? What is this, crazy? Are they not looking at, at the movies and seeing what's out there and hearing the music? There's so much demonic infestation in this country. Where's the followers of Jesus? Because when a follower of Jesus shows up, demons go, Gah! And that's what is a line of demarcation. Now let's go on because he draws another line here. It says that after he chooses the twelve and calls them, in verse 20 it says, then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying, he's out of his mind. Now this is Jesus' own family. They're looking at their brother and they're saying, He's out of his mind. Who does Jesus think he is? Now, it's not the crowd. You might say, oh, no, 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 the crowd was saying that. No, 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 no. Remember, the crowd's going to him for what? Healing and deliverance. They're not saying he's out of his mind. They want what he's got. So it's not the crowd saying that. It's his own family saying that. Well, I didn't know Jesus had a family. Absolutely he did. He had a mother, we know Mary. He had a father, Joseph. By this time, we know he is no longer alive. And I'll prove that to you in a minute. But what we'll see is that when his family heard what was going on and the commotion he's creating, they said, he's out of his mind. Can you imagine them sitting at the table? Jesus, what are all these people doing here? Well, they come to see the Son of God. Dude, you're my brother. You're not the Son of God. I know you. Right? Let me prove to you, just in a couple chapters later, Mark 6, Mark says this, Is not this the carpenter's son? This is what people in the community said. The son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us, Mary and Salome? I mean, they they label this. They, They let us know exactly who his brothers and sisters are. He has four brothers and two sisters. Now what we understand is this, that after Mary conceived, the seed was from God with her and, and, and for Jesus. But about the uh, late 300 AD, the church decided to make Mary a perpetual virgin. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. Uh, uh, Hebrew society would dictate that she needed to consummate her marriage to Joseph. Uh, and so after Jesus was born, Mary, or Miriam is her Hebrew name, would have consummated her marriage with Joseph and had other children. That would have been the Jewish thing to do to secure the covenant that she had with Joseph. Now we see that there were four brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and two sisters. Uh, church history says the two sisters' names 
is Miriam and Salome. And so there are siblings to Jesus. And what our verse told us is that these siblings said, you're crazy. They didn't believe him. Uh, and so we go on and look at what John chapter 7 says. In John 7, it says this, Jesus' brothers urged him to go to Judea for the celebration. Go where your followers can see your miracles. They scoffed. You can't become a public figure if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, prove it to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe him. Now, some people try to say, well, that's his disciples talking. Well, no, his disciples believed him. And they were followers. These people are scoffing him. And as the scriptures I just referenced, these are his brothers and sisters. Now, that's a fascinating thing. I don't know if any of you have ever run into this in your own family. But that can happen. Can you imagine his brothers are, are goading him? Come on, Jesus, you're going to do all these great things, Messiah. Why don't you go down and prove it? Do it in public. Wow. Now, we know Paul tells us in Galatians when he talks about the resurrection appearances of Jesus, he says that Jesus rose from the dead. And when he did, when he, did he appeared to James, his brother, and to Peter, and to 500 at another time. So in Corinthians, he tells us that too. So Paul is even confirming that Jesus had a brother named James who didn't believe in his brother Jesus, scoffed at him and said he's crazy, right? But once he saw his resurrected brother, he believed. <laughs> and in fact, he became the head of the church in Jerusalem. And so that's pretty amazing. But here Jesus draws a line. You see, look at verse 31 of Mark 3. And when his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, uh, your mother and your brothers are here, and they want you. Why did they want him? Why did his mother and brothers want him? Because he's out of his mind. That's what they thought, right? And he answered, who's my mother and who are my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my brothers, here is my mother, and here are my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. He drew another line between family relationships and said, if you're going to follow me, that love is greater than your family situation." Following Jesus is greater than following the crowds and it is coming unto Him to personally follow Him wherever He goes. And it also means you may have to no longer follow your family, but follow Christ. In fact, He said this in Matthew, Do not think that I come to bring peace on the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemy will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Our love for Christ must be the ultimate love in our family. Now understand the Hebrew content of this. Don't think you need to go home and tell your mother, I hate you. In Jesus' name. No. Honor your mother, father. Honor your brother, sister. You know, we're, we're to care and to we're love. But if they cause you to choose between them and Jesus, who should you follow? Jesus. Jesus, and in your devotion to Christ, you should be showing the love that they need to see. Some of you have been doing this for many years with an unsaved spouse, an unsaved loved one, but you must follow Christ above all things. Even Christ drew a line with His own family. Now they, come, they came around, how many of you know that? But He had to draw the line. So He draws another line that goes beyond even our closest relationships, so that we would follow Him. He goes on, let's go back now. Now, we see Him at the house. His, his mom and His brothers are, are coming to see Him because they think He's out of His mind. They end up there and, 
and say, we want to talk to you. And he says, uh, I don't listen to you anymore. Right? He listens to the Father. He began his ministry. He's 30 years old. You're not my mother. You're not my brothers. I will go do my Father's will. Amen? But someone else came along. Look at verse 22. The scribes and the Pharisees came down to Jerusalem saying, He's possessed by a devil. Everybody's got an opinion of Jesus. Guess what? Everybody's got an opinion of you. Right? So everybody thinks he's magical. Touch him and you get healed. Woo! So they think he's magical. Then he's got his disciples who know who he is. But then he's got his own family saying he's crazy. And then you got the Pharisees saying he's demonic. You better know where you stand. Or you'll be tossed by all of these opinions of people round about you. And how many of you know peer pressure takes most people out? So you need to know, where do you stand with Christ? Be a Christ follower. Well, they go on and they say, he's possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. That's how he casts out demons. Yeah, that's how he does it. And then he said to them, look it, can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom's divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. If a house is divided against itself, it can't stand. If Satan rises up against himself to beat himself up, he's divided. He can't stand but the end will come. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Jesus draws another line and says, I am not Satan. I'm not demonic. As a matter of fact, I'm thumping him. I am stronger than him and he's out of here. He draws a line and a delineation between the powers that Israel feared. They feared the demoniacs. They feared this. They became a a, a superstitious religious people. By their religion, it couldn't handle the power of Satan. Jesus says, look it, I bind that strong man. Look, you know, there are times in deliverances where the devil will fool someone and the devil will cast out some minor demonics and make noise so that the principality can still stay. That's fooling. But you, you can't vanquish The devil can't vanquish himself. Jesus came in and busted him up. Jesus came in and drove him out. Satan can't do that against himself. He absolutely crushed him under his feet. And he said, you can't enter into a strong man's house unless you bind him first. And that's exactly what Jesus did. When Jesus started his ministry, he busted up the stronghold of Satan over Israel. He's coming wherever he's going. People don't even ask to get delivered. The demons know who he is and they just cry out, I'm out of here! Because he's that powerful and that ferocious. Remember, the forceful take it by force. The kingdom of God has arrived on the shores of Galilee. The kingdom of God and the king has stepped on the land and every demonic power flees. How many of you remember when Jesus sent his disciples into the cities to go pray and deliver, when they came back, Jesus said, he said with excitement, I saw Satan fall like lightning to the earth. Because when his disciples, his disciples went into that town, Satan was destroyed. He wants his disciples to do the same today. He drew another line in the spirit, this time between demonic and heavenly. And there should be a clear line delineating in the spirit realm today between the church and the demonic. The church and false doctrine. There's got to be something more than simply us saying a creed. There's got to be something more than us just saying, I believe in Jesus. Something's got to show up in the spirit realm. Amen? And that's what Jesus said would happen with His disciples. He's got power over Satan. Now, He goes on and He says this. He speaks a parable, and this parable is key to Him drawing dividing lines. Again, he began to teach beside the sea and a very large crowd gathered around him so that he got into the boat and sat on the sea while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many parables and his teaching, he said this, listen, a sower went out to sow and as he sowed, now that means seed, putting seed in the ground, right? And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds of the air came and ate it up and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, 
where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up. But since there was no depth of soil, when the sun rose, it scorched it and it withered away. Other seed fell upon good soil, but there were thorns. And as it grew up, the thorns choked it off and it didn't bear fruit. Other seeds fell in good soil and produced grain growing and increasing 30, 60, and a hundredfold. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what I'm saying. So Jesus begins to tell parables. And that's, that's nothing unique. Rabbis of this time in the first century often taught in parables. We have a lot of parables left uh, from this period of time that different rabbis used. But Jesus' parables are unique because most of Jesus' parables talk about one unique person in them which reveals Him. His parables are about the kingdom. A parable is bringing a spiritual truth into a story or a reality for us to grasp because it's spiritual. It's of the kingdom, which we don't understand. So Jesus would use parables. Many of the rabbis of the day would use parables, but they just wanted to speak truth against leaders and political positions. It's a nice way to get a dig in on someone in a story. But Jesus used parables mostly about himself and who he was and what his kingdom work was supposed to do. And that's why Jesus spoke in parables. And so what he was doing was to bring heavenly understanding into the earthly realm. Now, it had a hidden meaning. Why? Because he was separating from those who were hungry to learn and those who just wanted to consume. They didn't want salvation or the deeper things. In other words, a parable makes you have to search for the meaning. If you're not interested, ah, fine, get done with the teaching so I can have another hamburger or whatever you're going to cook for me today. Or I want to see some more stuff happen. I want to see some more miracles. I want to see people delivered. I like that stuff where demons fly and run away. That was cool. Did you see that one today? It's like a wrestling match. But a parable has to go deeper. It demands something of you. You know, we're so, we're so hungry to get people saved. We, 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 we're trying to get everybody saved and even the people who could care less. Because we think the words we say are magical incantation. Something is going to happen. It's going to be... Many times Jesus challenged people. Jesus walked away from people. And he would give them the word, but he would know their heart. He would know if they wanted to seek more. And you need to learn to have eyes for those who are seeking for the things of God. And many times parables would separate the serious from those who are not serious. Listen to what his disciples said. When he was alone, those around him, the twelve, asked about the parables. And he said, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. So, To the disciples, they knew the secret of God. What's the secret of the kingdom of God? What did they know that no one else knew? Hmm. What did they know nobody else knew? Oh yeah, Him! Jesus! They knew Him. He is the secret of the kingdom. It was hidden from man from the beginning of time. The prophets didn't know what time Messiah would come. These are things the angels longed to look into. No one understood. Christ was hidden. If they had known what Christ was doing on the cross, they wouldn't have crucified Him, Paul said. It was a hidden mystery, but God made bare His arm. And the apostles are the ones who had the secret. They heard from Rabbi Jesus who He was. Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? You're the Son of the living God, the Messiah. That's right. Father has revealed that. So you guys got the inside scoop. Everybody else gets parables. Why? Because he's measuring it out. He's only got three years and he has to measure out his message so he can get it to penetrate the entire region of Israel and instruct his disciples. If it came too soon, how many of you remember a group tried to make him king by force? He split from that. He said, no, uh-uh. Right? And, and every demonic saying, you're the son of God. You're the son of God. Shut up. Don't tell anyone. Not yet. And he spoke in parables, so they had to think about it. They had to understand it. They had to look for it. They had to search for it, so that when the resurrection came, boom, they'd begin to get it. There are things in your lives 
that uh, how many of you remember uh, uh, time release capsules? There are things in your lives that have to wait for a time because you're not ready to handle what God needs to release in you. There are things that God is preparing you for. Revelations, works, and things for you to accomplish. But if He were to give it to you right now, you wouldn't, you'd run and run away. You'd scream. You couldn't handle it. So there are times of release in God's life. And that's what parables did. It released information out to the people, but they had to search for it. Now, he says something about this. He says, uh, they may indeed see, but not perceive. They hear, but they don't understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. But again, they want to go to John's baptism. They want to turn and be forgiven of their sins so they'll go back to the temple or they'll go to the River Jordan with John. You see, it wasn't time for them to know where their forgiveness comes from. It comes from the cross and He wasn't there yet. Does that make sense to you? So as He's speaking in these parables, He's downloading these stories and information to them, but it wouldn't be till after the cross that the release of understanding salvation is from the cross not back at the temple, or not because I'm a Jew. And that's why he used the parables. Now he says something quite interesting about this parable. He said in verse 13, do you not understand this parable? He says, if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand any of them. So this is the key, the kingpin parable. So let's understand what it means. What it means is, again, the drawing of lines and the delineation of the disciples of Jesus. Let me explain it to you quickly. He says, the sower sows the seed. Who's the sower? Jesus. Put this in the context of what Jesus is preaching. Jesus is the sower. We use this for evangelism. We use this parable as evangelism. But that's not what this parable is about. We also reduce this parable down to salvation. This parable is not about salvation. This parable is about Jesus who is bringing the Word. What is His Word? His yoke. His instruction. His revelation of who He is and what the kingdom is. He is bringing it to Israel. And as He brings it, it falls on hard ground and Satan steals it and takes it away it then falls on ground that is rocky. So it takes sprout people listen. They go, oh yeah, that's pretty good. I like it. And then persecution comes. I don't want to follow him. I don't need him. This is too hard. And then it falls on good soil. But you know what? Their care for the riches of this world and their jobs and their family life come and choke it off so they don't receive the words of Jesus. Last of all, that finds good soil. And in the good soil, it produces fruit and it produces a harvest of 30, 60, and 100% return. But see, what we've done with it is we've made it a story about salvation. And we say, well, what it is, is we preach the Word. Sometimes it falls on hard ground. And this works so far. But then we go, well, it it falls on rocky ground. People get saved uh, uh, and then... uh, they get saved, and, and but they don't go very far, and then they lose their salvation, and it falls away from them. And and then, but then there's other people who they get saved, but then the cares of this world come and entangle them, and they lose their salvation, and and it doesn't take. What does that say about salvation? Is that how cheap this thing is? Do you see what I mean? Comes and goes, comes and goes. It's all up to you. No, this isn't about salvation. This is about honoring the word of your rabbi. This is about the words of Jesus being his disciple. And now this word becomes more important to the church because we always used it for the lost when in fact its power is drawing a line of delineation to its followers. How many times has Christ spoken to you and the devil has taken that instruction away because you didn't pay attention? It's not about you having salvation or losing salvation. It's about being a disciple of Jesus. If you don't get this parable, none of them matter. But how many times has Jesus instructed you and asked you to do something and you took it, but because of rocky ground, not much uh, a root system, when persecution came, someone bothered you, someone made fun of you, you didn't do what Christ wanted you to do. So the word becomes null. 
How about you were called by the Lord? Many of you know you have a calling on your life. Many of you know you're supposed to do what God wants you to do. But the cares of this world and the finance and the job and the money has choked off that calling and that promise. God's promises are without uh, repentance. He'll keep them on you. But we let the world choke them off and we don't do anything with it. Makes a big difference, doesn't it? When you consider that every word of Jesus, every promise, and everything He asks you to do has the potential either to be burned off by persecution, choked off by your preoccupation, or will it produce 30, 60, and 100 fold fruit? Because if it finds good soil in your heart and you say, yes, Lord, and you are faithful to follow through, you will get a return on what Christ planted in your heart. You'll get 30, 60, and 100 fold. These are the disciples of Jesus. This is the story of Jesus calling His own. He called them who He chose to come unto Him, separate from the crowds, those that He's trusted to follow and to cast out demons and to preach this good news. Those who are willing to separate from mother, father, sister, brother, forsake all and follow Him. Those are His disciples. His disciples who will trample on serpents and demonics and not follow the ways of the world, but follow Him. These are the lines drawn in the delineation of those who are His disciples who will not burn off from the heat of the sun nor get choked off because of this world's concerns, but will produce a harvest back to their Master and their Savior. That's us. We are His disciples. This is a hard word for American Christianity. Because American Christianity says, yeah, I believe in Jesus. And that's it. That is not a disciple. Because too many folks who say, I believe in Jesus, are a burned out bush or a strangled out growth. They may be saved, but they're not producing 30, 60, and 100 fold fruit. Back unto the Lord. I would commission you as disciples of the Lord Jesus to obey Him, to follow Him, to walk after Him, to serve your Lord and your Master with all your heart, mind, soul, and body and to love your neighbors as yourself. And in doing this, you will reap a harvest that is coming. If you will obey the words that the Lord gives you today, tomorrow, next week, you will produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. I believe that with all my heart. You are the people of God. Let's bow our heads.